But we have a little something that takes place between that book and the one you're going to get tonight. It happens to be the voicemail account of a certain Magnus Bain. sort of host this evening. <laughs> I enjoy hosting. So you've all come. That's lovely. Uh, obviously, we're here tonight to celebrate some book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what either. But we're all here. We might as well stay. Obviously, we have some. We have Cassie right here. You may know. <laughs> and Holly, and Kelly and I, and we wanted to start this evening. And Josh. Also Josh. Oh, he's behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Josh snuck in. <laughs> and other, if any other people. <laughs> if any other people come in, I expect you to signal me. <laughs> We have a very special little treat to start, a little, little something to start off this evening. Uh, there was a certain incident that happened uh, in City of Lost Souls. <laughs> All right, everybody calm down. <laughs> Relax. Something happened in that book. A lot of things happened in that book. <laughs> But we have a little something that takes place between that book and the one you're going to get tonight. <laughs> it happens to be the voicemail account of a certain Magnus Bain. to get these tapes for you. Mm -hmm. That's how Scott died. <laughs> <laughs> and now we bring to you the voicemail of Magnus Bain. The voicemail of Magnus Bain, High Warlock of Brooklyn, in the days following a certain incident in City of Lost Souls. Today, 2 o'clock AM. Beep. <laughs> Hi, Magnus. It's Alec. Uh, Alexander, well, you know that. I'm just calling because I, I think we need to talk. I guess you're busy. Call me back, okay? Beep. <laughs> Today, 2.10 a.m. Hi, Magnus. This is Isabel Lightwood. There seems to have been a small misunderstanding. My brother came home under an impression I'm sure is totally mistaken. Call me or else and let's get this cleared up. I, I don't know why I said or else. We're all friends here. <laughs> Today, 2.35 a.m. Isabel speaking. <laughs> Maybe there hasn't been a misunderstanding. Maybe you just made a terrible error. <laughs> That's okay. People make mistakes. All they have to do is grovel and beg for forgiveness. <laughs> and then all is well. That's how it can be. I'm prepared to let this go once, Magnus. Beep. Today, 3 o'clock a.m. Let me just follow up by describing. <laughs> What a big mistake you would be making if you broke up with Alec. The Lightwoods are seriously hot people. <laughs> you, you are not. <laughs> <laughs> that was an 
inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> you are not going to meet any sexier shadow hunters, and that's saying something. <laughs> Because you know what they say about Shadowhunters, our business is fighting demons and looking fine, and business is booming. Some people say the Herondales used to be hot, but think about it. Not only do we outnumber them, but we took their last hottie and we made him ours. <laughs> looked back on portraits of our ancestors, Gabriel Lightwood was notably smoking. <laughs> it is rumored that one console agreed with everything my great, great aunt Felicia Lightwood ever said because when she, when she spoke, all he heard was foxy, foxy, foxy. <laughs> if you break up with Alec, you will not only be losing one stone cold fox, but a family of foxes. <laughs> to my children's children. No Lightwood is ever going to so much as wink at you in a bar. Think about that. Think about being Lightwoodless and lonely 500 years from now in a sad and chilly light nightclub on the moon. <laughs> Beep. Today, 11 a.m. Hi. It's... <laughs> I guess you're still busy. <laughs> That's okay. I know you have a lot of things to do. Just call me back when you're free. Whenever you're free, it doesn't matter what time. I'll be awake. I really want to talk to you. Beep. <laughs> Today, 2.30 p.m. Hello, Mr. Bain. This is Hadrian Industries. We're calling to engage your services for a simple ritual in the same vein as the one you performed for us last February. We would like you to bring a crate of horned toads with you. We shall, of course, amply compensate you for the toads. Beep. Today, 6 p.m. Meow. Meow. Ow, stupid cat. Uh, you told me stop calling Isabel, but I'm not the one calling you. Church is calling you. <laughs> <laughs> So here's something you may not have known before you committed your recent rash acts. Our cat church and your cat Sherman Meow, they are in love. <laughs> I've never seen such love before. I never knew such a love could exist in the heart of a cat. Some people say that love between two dude cats is wrong, but I think it's beautiful. Love makes church happier than I've ever seen him. Nothing makes him happy like Chairman Meow. Not tuna, not shredding centuries-old tapestries. Nothing. Please don't keep these cats apart. Please don't take the joy of love away from church. Look, this is really just a warning for your own good. If you keep church and Chairman Meow apart, church will start to get angry. You wouldn't like church when he's angry. Beep. Today. 5.15 p.m. Hi, Magnus, this is Clary. Nobody told me to make this phone call. <laughs> Honestly, when I first met Alec, I thought he was really horrible. Admittedly, I was a little off my game, what with finding out about magic worlds and my mom being kidnapped. That was a bad time, but Alec was still not my favorite person. He was a jerk, but he wasn't a jerk because he's a bad guy. He was a jerk because he was unhappy. He felt like he had to pretend to be someone he wasn't. I guess he learned that he had to hide things all the time when he was growing up, that he had to keep secrets or lose people. He's a lot better when he's with you. He's better because he's happier. I don't really know how relationships work. Jace is the only boyfriend I've ever had, and I have been informed that our relationship has not gone along traditional lines. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that's what a relationship is to me. No matter what else is going on, you're happiest when you're together. I'm not just calling because I'm worried about Alec. You seemed really happy with him too. I was wondering how you are. I hope you're doing okay. <laughs> Beep. Today, 8.26 p.m. Hi, Magnus. <laughs> this, this, is, this is Alec. Alexander. <laughs> I guess you don't want to talk to me. I can understand that. 
But I really think if we were together, if I could just explain, I'm so bad with words, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you always seem to know what I meant. I don't want to lose that. I don't want to lose you. I want to talk to you so badly, but if I can't, I guess I'm calling to say I'm really sorry. I just called to say that. Beep. Today, 9.39 PM. Uh, hi, Magnus. It's, uh, it's Simon. <laughs> You, you know me. Uh, I mean, you called me Sydney last time we spoke, but I mean, we've hung out. I'm calling to. Uh, I'm uh, sorry if this is out of line, but I suggest that you uh, maybe take Alec back. I think it would be uh, good for morale. Honestly, Alec was really horrible to Clary when they first met, and if he goes all cranky again, I don't know what Clary is going to do. In those days, Claire had way fewer weapons and way fewer brothers. <laughs> this time it's different. Her boyfriend is literally on fire. <laughs> <laughs> She's got enough problems. I guess what I'm saying is we'd all appreciate it if you took one for the team. <laughs> Not that I'm part of a Shadowhunter team. Shadowhunters don't let vampires on the team. <laughs> this message probably seems selfish and also crazy. I honestly do feel bad for Alec. He's a good guy, much less annoying than Jace. <laughs> I've always felt like, given the opportunity, we could be friends. We could be bros. We could be bros who shoot arrows together. <laughs> it may at this point be obvious that Isabel forced me to make this phone call. <laughs> Not really sure what I'm supposed to say. Here's the thing. Alec looks really bad. Ow, Isabel, I mean, he's looking fine. He looks very fine. He's a very handsome guy. <laughs> Much better looking than Jace, if you ask me. <laughs> but he's obviously really down. Anyone can see it. I don't really notice how guys look most of the time, but even I can see it. He has black rings under his eyes, and his sweaters are just coming apart with despair. <laughs> his mom is worried he's not eating. I heard Jace uh, hinting about hairbrushes yesterday. <laughs> of course, for a badass warrior, Jace is kind of prissy. <laughs> I don't know what happened between you guys, but I know when someone is sorry. I can tell you, whatever he did, Alec is sorry. If you give him a break, that would be great. Okay, I guess that's it. Uh, please don't ever tell Jace I said he was a badass warrior. Beep. Today, 11.48 PM. No, you listen with your not calling back face. You're making a big mistake. I was the best thing that ever happened to you. Okay, statistically, that's not very likely. A lot of stuff has happened to you. A lot of people have happened to you. I think that was what made me do what I did. I just wanted to know that I wasn't, you know, long down on a long list. I didn't want to be a pretty mediocre footnote in the story of your life. Oh, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. Jace, Jace, wake up. Jace, how do you delete messages on someone else's phone? <laughs> Beep. Today, 8, 11 a.m. Mr. Bain, I'm authorized to contact you on behalf of my client. It is my opinion, and I consider it will be the opinion of the judge that your actions vis-a-vis -vis terminating your relationship with one Alexander Gideon Lightwood Esquire were unlawful. I have in my office's witnesses and documentation to prove that you were in fact common law married, and Mr. Lightwood could claim half of your freehold in Brooklyn. <laughs> All right, fine, it's Isabel calling again. <laughs> All right, my lawyer is Church. But I truly believe we have a case, and Church has never lost a lawsuit. Answer the phone, Magnus. Beep. Today, 10.31 AM. Mr. Bain, I am calling to leave a message on an urgent business matter. One of our representatives called about the matter of the horned toads delivery. He described your manner of answering the phone as curt and extremely harsh and your tone is wild, not to say maddened. Is there a problem with the toads? We are very concerned. <laughs> Beep. Today, 7.52 PM. Listen up, buddy. Nobody breaks up with a light wood. Nobody. <laughs> Melion thought he could tell his fairy buddies over cups of me that he's broken up with me. And all I'm saying is Melion hasn't seen his fairy steed in a while. <laughs> One guy visited the Institute and he thought he could leave a Dear Jane letter for me as he walked out the door. Jace found that letter. 
Ten minutes later, the guy had a broken wrist and a concussion. Then I let Jason in. <laughs> this is Isabel, by the way. <laughs> Beep. Today, 8.01 PM. Hello, Bane. I mean, uh, Magnus, greetings. Magnus Bane, hi, Warlock of Brooklyn from Reese Lightwood of the New York Institute, um, head of the New York Institute. I'm totally the head, and I am calling on Shadowhunter business because I am in charge of all Shadowhunter business. The matter on which I'm calling is a complex one, too complex to be discussed over the phone, I think, upon consideration. That it would be best if you visited the Institute so we could discuss this in person. Please do not misunderstand me. This is a professional phone call about a purely business matter. I am simply intent on important shadow hunter business. You would naturally be welcome to stay for tea and social conversation with whatever members of the Institute might happen to be present at the time of your visit. <laughs> After we conclude our business, of course. Beep. Today, 10.29 PM. Greetings to High Warlock Magnus Bain from the New York Werewolf Clan. Uh, this is Maya Roberts. Um, uh, Luke would have called, but he's in the bathroom. Shut up. <laughs> he's been in the bathroom for a really long time. <laughs> hey, uh, we think it might be food poisoning. He's been in the bathroom for so long that we believe that he is no longer our leader. Uh, anyway, the werewolves would like to visit with you. You know, just one of those friendly werewolf on warlock visits and whoever else happens to show up at the meeting. I just want to stay for the record. This is so stupid and he's not going to buy it. Beep. Today, 1.06 AM. I'm outside your door, Magnus. <laughs> I would have already broken it down if you hadn't put up stupid warlock spells like a stupid warlock cheater. Answer the door right now or I'll kill you. I know you're in there. I know you broke my brother's heart. I am not going to stand for it. Answer the door right now so I can kill you. <laughs> Beep. Today, 2.33 AM. Greetings, Magnus Bain, High Warlock of Brooklyn from Rafael Santiago of the New York Vampire Clan. <laughs> Loyal servant of our glorious Queen Maureen. <laughs> Forever may she reign in dark glory. And the future Prince Consort Simon, Babelicious Rock God. <laughs> We have to begin all of our telephone calls in this manner now, including our nightly call to a place called Hot Topic. <laughs> it would be needless to state after this introduction that I consider myself a damned soul. <laughs> I am contacting you because our queen wished to send a summons to the shiny man who is Simon's friend. <laughs> that is a quote. She adds that she supports you and is a fan of much Yao manga. <laughs> I have no idea what that means and I never wish to know. While I'm on the telephone, Lily happened to overhear some not terribly interesting conversation at talkies between several melodramatic teenagers of your acquaintance. Imagine my surprise when I learned that the ill-advised relationship between yourself and an excessively young male shadow hunter has been abruptly and unpleasantly concluded. I wanted to inform you that your esteemed colleague Ragnar Fell now owes me $10 due to a small bet that we made amongst ourselves on the subject of how that absurd liaison would end. <laughs> of course, Ragnar will never pay me $10 because he was murdered by the Nephilim due to a conflict between the Nephilim and the downward worlders that were, that were for some reason embroiled in. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the conflict we are currently having, so I suppose you could say that Ragnar died for nothing. Shadow Hunters, could their new motto be something like, not worth the bother? Beep. Today, 11.23 AM. <clears throat> Hi, Magnus. This is Isabel. <laughs> I'm calling to apologize for attempting to break down your door for the phone calls and visits that I've been told might have counted as harassment. 
and for describing you to all your neighbors as a filthy down vulgar love weasel. <laughs> Though I realized some of the things I said might have seemed threatening. Of course, as a shadow hunter, I would never inflict physical harm on anyone not engaged in evil, or at least being annoying. <laughs> I feel I was pretty reasonable the entire time. <laughs> and playing it pretty cool. But I'm told that from an outside perspective, it looks like I may have slightly lost my head. <laughs> the truth is, I don't have to threaten you with anything worse than you've already done to yourself. Alec is brave, and he's good, and he's loyal. And like all Lightwoods, he has cheekbones you could use to slice salami. <laughs> You're never going to find anybody as great as my brother or anyone who loves you as much. He's one of the best things in my life, and I'm prepared to bet he's one of the best things in yours. You're going to be sorry when you wake up and realize what you threw away. In exchange for my promise to be cool in the future, I'd appreciate it if you delete this sappy message. I have your reputation in this town to keep up. <laughs> Beep. Today, 4.02 p.m. Hi, Magnus. This is Alec. I'm just calling to say that I might have asked a couple of people who you were actually talking to if they could possibly put in a good word with, for you, for me, with you. And it has now been brought to my attention that a couple of people might have taken things slightly too far. <laughs> So I guess this is me calling to tell you that I'm really sorry again. I won't call again. I won't text. I'm sorry about all the texts, especially about the one I sent at 3.15 in the morning on Wednesday. You know the one. Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. You can call me or text me, though, if you ever want to. I don't expect you will, but I really hope you do. I won't stop hoping. Oh no. <laughs> Beep. <laughs> Today, 5.06 p.m. Mr. Bain, this is Hadrian Industries calling to inform you that you are extremely late for the appointment we made. <laughs> we have been waiting for over an hour. There is no sign of you. There is no sign of the toads. We want to. <laughs> The final message in this series was cut off. These records were obtained with some difficulty from a cell phone which appeared to have been broken and burned with intense magical fire. <laughs> book edition that you can take and take and keep in your house and whatever you do with your stuff. <laughs> now, I'm looking at you people out there and I'm thinking, these are people that don't know these books very well. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. And most of you are like, I don't even know why I'm here. <laughs> so, because you don't know much about these books or anything that's happening in them, we thought to get you ready for what's going to happen tonight. You know what's happening tonight, right? <laughs> okay, great. Let's check in. We're going to give you a little something, something from each one of the books in order to kind of bring you up to the moment. A little something. If we can start. You've read these already. I'm letting you know. <laughs> but we're bringing it back to you so you get excited. We're bringing sexy back. We're bringing sexy back. Yeah. That's, all, that's a lot. <laughs> right, someone say you never left. I gotta... <laughs> You're still behind me. I am. I'm watching you more. Making me very nervous. <laughs> we begin. Right. So I'm going to read from City of Bones, but I, because we're here to celebrate Cassie, I feel as much as we are the new book, I wanted to say two things, that um, two misconceptions that Cassie helped clear up for me about writers. Um, although at the time that she cleared them up, I had actually been a writer for a while. And the, the first is that, you know, I, my, my feeling that what writers did was that they worked in their pajamas or their sweatpants. Um, and then I met Cassie, and I realized that this is not true. Cassie is always beautifully dressed. Um, 
being a writer is fancy business. <laughs> and you might think that this is just Cassie dressed up for an event, but in actual fact, Cassie is always dressed like this. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting to um, go work with Cassie. It's like her fourth outfit of the day. I also, I also thought that writers worked alone at home at their desk, and this hmm. is also not true. Um, I have worked with Cassie in coffee shops and restaurants and in swimming pools. <laughs> Spent many, many hours working in swimming pools with Cassie. And um, that's the most important thing, though, is that um, writers don't have to work by themselves. That is an actually one of the, the, the best things about my life right now is that I get to get together with Cassie and Holly and whoever else is in town um, and, and work together. And it's really a lot of fun to have the opportunity to go out and write with Cassie. And so it's very pleasurable to be able to celebrate these books and you. <laughs> So this is a section in which uh, Clary and Jason, Simon and Isabel have come to a party to find out why a warlock named Magnus Bane has put a magical block on Clary's memory. The loft was huge and almost totally empty of furniture. Floor to ceiling windows were smeared with a thick foam of dirt and paint, blocking out most of the ambient light from the street. Big metal pillars wound with colored lights held up an arched city ceiling. Doors turn off their hinges and laid across dented metal garbage cans made a makeshift bar at one end of the room. A lilac-skinned woman in a metallic bustier was ranging drinks along the bar in tall, harshly colored glasses that tinted the fluid inside them. Blood red, cyanosis blue, poison green. Even for a New York bartender, she worked with an amazingly speedy efficiency, probably helped along by the fact that she had a second set of long, graceful arms to go with the first. Clary was reminded of Luke's Indian goddess statue. The rest of the crowd was just as strange. A good-looking boy with wet green-black hair grinned at her over a platter of what looked like raw fish. His teeth were sharp and serrated like a shark's. Beside him stood a girl with long, dirty blonde hair braided with flowers. Under the skirt of her short green dress, her feet were webbed like a frog's. A group of young women so pale, Clary wondered if they were wearing white stage makeup sipped scarlet liquid too thick to be wine from fluted crystal glasses. The center of the room was packed with bodies dancing to the pounding beat that bounced off the walls so Clary couldn't see a band anywhere. You like the party? She turned to see Magnus lounging against one of the pillars, his eyes shone in the darkness. Glancing around, she saw that Jace and the others were gone, swallowed up by the crowd. She tried to smile. Is it in honor of anything? My cat's birthday. <laughs> oh, she glanced around, where's your cat? He unhitched himself from the pillar looking solemn. I don't know. He ran away. <laughs> Clary was spared responding to this by the reappearance of Jace and Alec. Alec looked sullen as usual. Jace was wearing a strand of tiny glowing flowers around his neck and seemed pleased with himself. <laughs> Where are Simon and Isabel, Clary said. On the dance floor, he pointed. She could just see them on the edge of the packed square of bodies. Simon was doing what he usually did in lieu of dancing, which was to bounce up and down on the balls of his feet, looking uncomfortable. <laughs> Isabel was slinking in a circle around him, sinuous as a snake, trailing her fingers across his chest. She was looking at him as if she were planning to drag him off into a corner to have sex. <laughs> Clary hugged her arms around herself, her bracelets clanking together. If they dance any closer together, they won't have to go off to a corner to have sex. <laughs> Look, Jay said, turning to Magnus, we really need to talk to Magnus Bain. The deep, booming voice belonged to a surprisingly short man who looked to be in his early 30s. He was compactly muscular, with a bald head shaved smooth and a pointed goatee. He leveled a trembling finger at Magnus. Someone just poured holy water into the gas tank on my bike. It's ruined. Destroyed. All the pipes are melted. Melted, murmured Magnus. How dreadful. I want to know who did it. The man bared his teeth, showing long, pointed canines. Clary stared in fascination. They didn't look at all the way she'd imagined vampire fangs. These were as thin and sharp as needles. I thought you'd swore there'd be no wolfmen here tonight, Bane. I invited none of the moon's children, Magnus said, examining his glittery nails. Precisely because of your stupid little feud, if any of them decided to sabotage your bike, they weren't a guest of mine and are therefore, he offered a winsome smile, not my responsibility. The vampire roared with rage, jabbing his finger toward Magnus. Are you trying to tell me that Magnus's glitter-coated index finger twitched just a fraction, so slightly that Clary almost thought he hadn't moved at all. Midroar, the vampire gagged and clutched at his throat. His mouth worked, 
but no sound came out. You've worn out your welcome, Magnus said, lazily opening his eyes very wide. Clary saw with a jolt of surprise that they had vertical slit pupils like a cat's. Now go. He splayed the fingers of his hand, and the vampire turned as smartly as if someone grabbed his shoulders and spun him around. He marched back into the crowd, headed to the door. Jace whistled under his breath. That was impressive. You mean that little hissy fit? Magnus cast his eyes toward the ceiling. I know. What is her problem? Alec made a choking noise. After a moment, Clary recognized it as laughter. He ought to do that more often. We put the holy water in his gas tank, you know, he said. Alec, said Jace, shut up. I assume that, said Magnus, looking amused. Vindictive little bastards, aren't you? You know their bikes run on demon energies. I doubt he'll be able to repair it. One less leech with a fancy ride, said Jace. My heart bleeds. I heard some of them can make their bikes fly, put in Alec, who looked animated for once. He was almost smiling. Merely an old wife's tale. Witch's tail, said Magnus, his cat's eyes glittering. So is that why you wanted to crash my party, just to wreck some bloodsucker bikes? No. Jace was all business again. We need to talk to you, preferably somewhere private. Magnus raised an eyebrow. Damn, Clary thought, another one. Am I in trouble with the clave? No, said Jace. Probably not, said J Alec. Ow, he glared at Jace, who had kicked him sharply in the ankle. No, Jace repeated. We can talk to you under the seal of the covenant. If you help us, anything you say will be confidential. And if I don't help you? Jace spread his hands wide. The rune tattoos on his palms stood out stark and black. Maybe nothing, maybe a visit from the silent city. Magnus's voice was honey poured over shards of glass. That's quite a choice you're offering me, little shadow hunter. It's no choice at all, said Jace. Yes, said the warlock. That's exactly what I meant. I totally missed that you seeded that Simon and Isabel stuff in that early, by the way. I had no memory that that scene existed. Yeah, Simon and Isabel, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> so I'm going to be reading a little bit from City of Ashes, and I'm um, very excited to read this part. Uh, so Cassie writes really, really fast, a thing which I'm sure I don't have to tell you, considering how big these books are and how many of them have come out over what stretch of time. Very, very quickly, once I remember we were in... The mountains of Utah. I oh, believe yeah. I was bleeding from my nose because I get uh, <laughs> I get I get very sick when I'm up high. That was gross. And we were at this writers retreat where writers gather to talk about the industry. So we were sitting there. There was a bunch of us sitting around talking about the industry while Cassie, in the background, wrote ten thousand words. <laughs> However, she does not write quickly when it comes to one thing. There is. <laughs> uh, they drive her crazy, and she complains constantly to me about them. I think because I have written fairies, somehow she feels I am responsible <laughs> for the fact that she finds it, the way they talk annoying. And I have said to her, Cassie, you are writing them. You can write them talking any way you like. But no. <laughs> she both writes them this way and then complains about it. <laughs> so I will be reading to you a little bit um, from the Seely Queen section. And uh, it always makes me happy. Uh, in part because I know she had to write it so slowly. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which is my revenge. And also, um, also, it makes me happy because looking forward, I know the dark artifices are full of fairies. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I just heard lots of people tweeting. <laughs> the queen's lips curved into a smile. I think you're a liar, but what a charming one. Charming enough that I will swear you this. Ask your father that question, and I will promise you what aid is in my power, should you strike against Valentine. Jace smiled. Your generosity is as remarkable as your loveliness, lady. Clary made a gagging noise, but the queen looked pleased. And I think we're done here now, <laughs> Jace added, rising from the cushions. He set his untouched drink down earlier beside Isabel's. They all rose after him. Isabel was already talking to Meliorn in the corner by the vine door. He looked slightly hunted. A moment. The queen rose. One of you must remain. Jace paused halfway to the door and turned to face her. What do you mean? She stretched out one hand to indicate Clary. Once our food or drink passes mortal lips, the mortal is ours. You know that, Shadow Hunter. Clary was stunned. I, but I didn't drink any of it. She turned to Jace. She's lying. 
Fairies don't lie, he said, confusion and dawning anxiety chasing each other across his face. He turned back to the queen. I'm afraid you're mistaken, lady. Look to her fingers and tell me she didn't lick them clean. Simon and Isabel were staring now. Clary glanced down at her hand. Of, of blood, she said. One of the sprites bit my finger. It was bleeding. She remembered the sweet taste of the blood mixed with the juice on her finger. Panicked, she moved toward the vine door and stopped as what felt like invisible hands shoved her back into the room. She turned to Jace, stricken. It's true. Jace's face was flushed. I suppose I, I should have expected a trick like that, he said to the queen, his previous flirtation gone. Why are you doing this? What do you want from us? The queen's voice was soft as spider's fur. Perhaps I'm only curious, she said. It is not often I have young shadow hunters so close within my purview. Like us, you your, trace your ancestry to heaven. That intrigues me. But unlike you, said Jace, there is nothing of hell in us. You are mortal, you age, you die, the queen said dismissively. If that is not hell, pray tell me what is. If you just want to study a shadow hunter, I won't be much use to you, Clary cut in. Her hand ached where the sprite had bitten it, and she fought the urge to scream or burst into tears. I don't know anything about shadow hunting. I hardly have any training. I'm the wrong person to pick. On, she added silently. For the first time, the queen looked directly at her. Clary wanted to shrink back. In truth, Clarissa Morgenstern, you are precisely the right person. Her eyes gleamed as she took in Clary's discomfiture. Thanks to the changes your father worked in you, you are not like other shadow hunters. Your gifts are different. My gifts? Clary was bewildered. Yours is the gift of words that cannot be spoken, the queen said to her. And your brother is the angel's own gift. Your father made sure of it when your brother was a child and before you were ever born. My father never gave me anything, Clary said. He didn't even give me a name. Jace looked as blank as Clary felt. While the fair folk do not lie, he said, they can be lied to. I think you have been the victim of a trick or joke, my lady. There is nothing special about myself or my sister. How deftly you don't play your charm, said the queen with a laugh. Though you must know, you are not of the usual sort of human boy, Jonathan. She looked from Clary to Jace to Isabel. Isabel closed her mouth, which had been wide open with a snap, and back at Jace again. Could it be that you do not know, she murmured. I know that I will not leave my sister here in your court, said Jace. And since there is nothing to be learned from either her or myself, perhaps you could do us the favor of releasing her. Now that you've had your fun, his eyes said, though his voice was polite and cool as water. The queen's smile was wide and terrible. What if I told you she could be freed by a kiss? You want Jace to kiss you, Clara said, bewildered. <laughs> the queen burst out laughing, and immediately the courtiers copied her mirth. The laughter was bizarre and inhuman mix of hoots, squeaks, and cackles, like the high shrieking of animals in pain. Despite his charms, the queen said, that kiss will not free the girl. The four looked at each other, startled. I could kiss Meliorn, suggested Isabel. <laughs> nor that, nor any one of my court. Meliorn moved away from Isabel, who looked at her companions and threw up her hands. I'm not kissing any of you, she said firmly, just so it's official. <laughs> that, that hardly seems necessary, Simon said, if a kiss is all. He moved towards Clary, who was frozen in surprise. When he took her by the elbow, she had to fright the urge to push him away. Not that she hadn't kissed Simon before, but this would have been a peculiar situation, even if kissing him were something she was entirely comfortable doing, which it wasn't. And yet it was the logical answer, wasn't it? Without being able to help it, she cast a quick look over her shoulder at Jace and saw him scowl. No, said the queen in a voice like tinkling crystal. crystal. That is not what I want either. Isabel rolled her eyes. Oh, for the angel's sake, look, if there's no other way of getting out of this, I'll kiss Simon. <laughs> I've done it before. It wasn't that bad. <laughs> Thanks, said Simon. That's very flattering. <laughs> Alas, said the queen of the Seely Court. Her expression was sharp with a cruel sort of delight, and Clary wondered if it weren't a kiss she wanted so much as simply to watch them all squirm in discomfort. I'm afraid that won't do either. Well, I'm not kissing the mundane, said Jace. I'd rather stay down here and rot. Forever, said Simon? Forever's an awfully long time. 
Jace raised his eyebrows. I knew it, he said. You want to kiss me, don't you? <laughs> Simon threw up his hands in exasperation. Of course not, but I... I guess it's true what they say, observed Jace. There are no straight men in the trenches. <laughs> That's atheist, jackass, said Simon furiously. There are no atheists in the trenches. <laughs> While this is all very amusing, said the queen coolly, leaning forward, the kiss that will free the girl is the kiss she most desires. The cruel delight in her face and voice had sharpened, and her words seemed to stab into Clary's ears like needles. Only that and nothing more. Simon looked as if she had hit him. Clary wanted to reach out to him, but she stood frozen to the spot, too horrified to move. Why are you doing this? Jace demanded. I rather thought I was offering you a boon. Jace flushed, but said nothing. He avoided looking at Clary. Simon said, that's ridiculous. They're brother and sister. The queen shrugged, a delicate twitch of her shoulders. Desire is not always lessened by disgust nor can it be bestowed like a favor to those most deserving of it. And as my words bind my magic, so you, so, can you, so you can know the truth. If she doesn't desire his kiss, she won't be free. <coughs> Simon said something angrily to Clary, but she didn't hear him. Her ears were buzzing as if a swarm of angry bees were trapped inside her head. Simon whirled around, looking furious, and said, You don't have to do this. Clary, it's a trick. <coughs> Not a trick, said Jace, a test. Well, I don't know about you, Simon, said Isabel, her voice edged, but I'd like to get Clary out of here. Like you'd kiss Alec, Simon said, just because the queen of the Seely Court asked you to. Sure I would, Isabel sounded annoyed. If the other option was being stuck in the Seely Court forever, who cares anyway? It's just a kiss. That's right. It was Jace. Clary saw him at the blurred edge of her vision as he moved toward her and put a hand on her shoulder, turning her to face him. It's just a kiss, he said. And though his tone was harsh, his hands were inexplicably gentle. She let him turn her, looked up at him. His eyes were very dark, perhaps because it was so dim down here in the court, perhaps because of something else. She could see a reflection in each of his dilated pupils, a tiny image of herself inside his eyes. He said, you can close your eyes and think of England if you like. <laughs> I've never been to England, she said, <laughs> but she shut her eyelids. She could feel the dank heaviness of her clothes, cold and itchy against her skin, and the clawing sweet air of the cave, colder yet, and the weight of Jace's hands on her shoulders, the only things that were warm. And then he kissed her. She felt the brush of his lips light at first, and her own opened automatically beneath the pressure. Almost against her will, she felt herself go fluid and pliant, stretching upward to twine her arms around his neck the way the sunflower twists toward light. His arms slid around her, her hand, his hands nodding in her hair, and the kiss stopped being gentle and became fierce all in a single moment, like tinder flaring into a blaze. Clary heard a sound, like a sigh, rush through the court, all around them a wave of noise, but it meant nothing, was lost in the rush of her blood through her veins, the dizzying sense of weightlessness in her body. Jesus' hands moved from her hair, slid down her spine. She felt the hard press of his palms against her shoulder blades, and then he pulled away, gently disentangling, disengaging himself, drawing her hands away from his neck and stepping back. For a moment, Clary thought she might fall. She felt as if something essential had been torn away from her, an arm or a leg, and she stared at Jace in blank astonishment. What did he feel? Did he feel nothing? She didn't think she could bear it if he felt nothing. He looked back at her, and when she saw the look on his face, she saw his eyes at Renwick's, when he had watched the portal that separated him from his home shatter into a thousand irretrievable pieces. He held her gaze for a split second, then looked away from her, the muscles in his throat working. His hands were clenched into fists at his sides. Was that good enough? He called, turning to face the queen and the courtiers behind her. Did that entertain you? The queen had a hand across her mouth, half covering a smile. We are quite entertained, she said. <laughs> but not so much, I think, as both of you. <laughs> I can only assume, said Jace, that mortal emotions amuse you because you have none of your own. <laughs> the smile slipped from her mouth at that. Easy, Jace, said Isabel. She turned to Clary. Can you leave now? Are you free? Clary went to the door and was not surprised to find no resistance barring her way. She stood with her hands among the vines and turned to Simon. 
He was staring at her as if he'd never seen her before. We should go, she said, before it's too late. It's already too late, he said. So, um, speaking of fairies, um, it, is, it is often, one of the conversations I'm most often drawn into is what are, what are some of the best YA books with gay and lesbian characters? And invariably, Cassie's books always come up. Um, and it's something that I think I'm particularly proud of Yes, you for doing in these books because I have met lots of people who are affected by that. And let's face it, um, she probably had the gay boys in her corner just for those shoes alone. Um, they are great shoes. But I think what is amazing about these books is that Cassie just writes such great gay love stories, um, one in particular. And I think she does it because she's learned the secret, which is that to write a great gay love story, the secret is to just write great love stories. And that is what she does. So it is my honor um, to be subbing in for Scott and to get to read a scene from City of Glass. Goodbye, Scott. We in which, <laughs> yeah. A moment for Scott. Yeah, a moment of silence. Yeah. All right, anyway. All right. <laughs> um, hard crowd. So I'm hard. going to read a scene or a passage in which Alec, for some reason, is very distracted. <laughs> Are you serious, Simon? Is it it's really true? That's fantastic. It's wonderful. Isabel reached out for her brother's hand. Alec, did you hear what Simon said? Jace isn't Valentine's son. He never was. So wh whose son is he? Alec replied, though Simon had the feeling that he was only partly paying attention. He seemed to be casting around the room for something. His parents stood a little distance away, frowning in their direction. Simon had been worried he'd have to explain the whole business to them too, but they'd nicely allowed him a few minutes with Isabel and Alec alone. Who cares? Isabel threw her hands up in delight, then frowned. Actually, that's a good point. Who was his father? Michael Wayland, after all? Simon shook his head. Stephen Herondale. So he was the Inquisitor's grandson, Alex said. That must be why she, he broke off, staring into the distance. Why she what, Isabel demanded. Alec, pay attention, or at least tell us what you're looking for. Not what, said Alec. Who? Magnus. I wanted to ask him if he'd be my partner in the battle, but I've no idea where he is. Have you seen him? He asked, directing his question at Simon. Simon shook his head. He was up on the dais with Clary, but he craned his neck to look. He's not now. He's probably in the crowd somewhere. Really? Are you going to ask him to be your partner? Isabel asked. It's like a cotillion, this partner's business, except with killing. <laughs> So exactly like a cotillion, said Simon. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask you to be my partner, Simon, Isabel said, raising an eyebrow delicately. Alec frowned. He was, like the rest of the shadow hunters in the room, entirely geared up, all in black with a belt from which dangled multiple weapons. A bow was strapped across his back. Simon was happy to see he'd found a replacement for the one Sebastian had smashed. Isabel, you don't need a partner because you're not fighting. You're too young. And if you even think about it, I'll kill you. His head jerked up. Wait, is that Magnus? Isabel, following his gaze, snorted. Alec, that's a werewolf. <laughs> a girl werewolf. <laughs> In fact, it's what's her name? May? Maya, Simon corrected. She was standing a little ways away, wearing brown leather pants and a tight black t-shirt that said, whatever doesn't kill me had better start running. <laughs> a cord held back her braided hair. She turned as if sensing their eyes on her and smiled. Simon smiled back. Isabel glowered. Simon stopped smiling hastily. <laughs> when, exa when exactly had his life gotten so complicated? <laughs> Alex's face lit up. 
There's Magnus, he said, and took off without a backward glance, shearing a path through the crowd to the space where the tall warlock stood. Magnus's surprise as Alec approached him was visible, even from this distance. It's sort of sweet, said Isabel, looking at them, you know, in kind of a lame way. <laughs> Why lame? Because, Isabel explained, Alec's trying to get Magnus to take him seriously, but he's never told our parents about Magnus or even that he likes, you know, warlocks, Simon said. <laughs> Very funny, Isabel glared at him. You know what I mean. What's going on here is, what is going on exactly, asked Maya, striding into earshot. I mean, I don't quite get this partner's thing. How is it supposed to work? Like that. Simon pointed toward Alec and Magnus, who stood a bit apart from the crowd in their own small space. Alec was drawing on Magnus's hand, his face intent, his dark hair falling forward to hide his eyes. So we all have to do that, Maya said. Get drawn on, I mean. <laughs> Only if you're going to fight, Isabel said, looking at the other girl coldly. You don't look 18 yet. Maya smiled tightly. I'm not a shadow hunter. Lycanthropes are considered adults at 16. Well, you have to get drawn on then said Isabel, by a shadow hunter, so you'd better look for one. But Maya, still looking over at Alec and Magnus, broke off and raised her eyebrows. Simon turned to see what she was looking at and stared. Alec had his arms around Magnus and was kissing him full on the mouth. <laughs> Magnus, who appeared to be in a state of shock, stood frozen. <laughs> Several groups of people, shadow hunters and downworlders alike, were staring and whispering. Glancing to the side, Simon saw the Lightwoods, their eyes wide, gaping at the display. <laughs> Maya looked perplexed. Wait a second, she said. Do we all have to do that, too? <laughs> has told beautiful, moving stories about Cassie, as if she isn't here. <laughs> Cassie, if she were here, she'd just want us to know. Well, she is here. I want to tell a beautiful story about our first time together, Cassie, that you can contribute to. Okay. I know you're here. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> when I first met Cassie, it was right before City of Bones came out. And for some reason, a group of us had decided in our infinite wisdom, that we were going to go to a convention called Dragon Con oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in Atlanta. For some reason, I had lost a bet, and I was going to go dressed as Wonder Woman. <laughs> and we were all going to take a midnight train to Georgia. <laughs> There's a video of this on YouTube. There is a video of this. It. Yeah, we took an overnight train ride. We took an 18 to 20 hour train ride leaving New York, because we just thought, instead of taking an hour and a half plane trip, why not <laughs> take a 20-hour train ride? That was Scott's idea, actually, which, was Scott. which is why he's not which here. Is why. <laughs> and that's how Scott died. <laughs> <laughs> well, there were only so many sleeping bunks. They had like the really nice sleeping bunks, and they had like the kind of nice sleeping bunks, and then they just had the chairs. <laughs> and they took, immediately Scott took the nice sleeping bunk to make it <laughs> mine. And then there was another one, which I think, Originally, Holly and Theo got into, and then Cassie and I got this sort of other bunk <laughs> that we were like, it's fine. And it was a little tiny compartment that had two kind of seats facing each other. So we were just like, this is nice. <laughs> and then it had a mysterious third seat. <laughs> <laughs> and it looked like a little kind of tray table sort of next to the, we were like, what's that? And it turned out that it was a toilet. <laughs> 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 It was just there. It like wasn't covered up or anything. It was just there. Like just anyone could look at it. And so Cassie and I got really upset <laughs> about this upset. toilet. We couldn't look at it. And we didn't want anything to be put down on it. And at night they would come and they would turn your, your bed this into like a bunk bed situation. But the toilet was still there. <laughs> just sloshing around. <laughs> and there was like a folding sink that you could flip down from the wall. And we made a vow at 
that moment to never use that toilet. <laughs> We didn't. We didn't, use, that <laughs> we didn't use the toilet. But with that's sort of the whole story: is that we just refused to use the toilet, and then eventually Holly was like, "I'm game." <laughs> <laughs> toilet in the room. <laughs> Free toilet. <laughs> they took the open toilet cabin, and we went into the sleeping bunk, which we much preferred. Well, we had to pay Holly. Remember, she actually had the nicer, fancier room with like a toilet you where the door her. closed. I paid her, and paid I was her. like, "I will give you however much money you want." <laughs> <laughs> so that I can get away from that toilet. <laughs> and she gouged me. She gouged me. And that was the beautiful story of Cassie and I bonding over our terrible, terrible fear of this exposed chemical toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Because I passed people in that cabin and they didn't even completely shut their doors and they were just <laughs> using it. <laughs> no shame. <laughs> well, we're back, we're up to the, uh, we're up to City of Fallen Angels and by this point, I said to Cassie, I said, Cassie, I'm Simon's number one fan. She did say that. I am, Cass I am Simon's number one fan and you should write a book called City of Simon. And she's <laughs> like, nope. <laughs> I am still pushing for City of Simon. And so one day Cassie came to me and said, hey, listen, hey, listen, crazy. You want to be Simon's number one fan? I'm going to put you in the book. <laughs> yeah. It's true, right? It's absolutely true. Well, Maureen spent like six months staring at me crazily across a table in witchcraft on 8th Street, and eventually I broke, like a, I buckled like a cheap belt, and I was like, I'll put you in the book. Just stop looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> she did. She did. And she's like, so she wrote it, and she's like, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you take a look at this first, because this Maureen is, in this book is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you're gonna be okay with it. Like, I can change your name. And I read it, and I was like, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into it. And so now, a little bit from that beautiful, beautiful, it's just. <laughs> Outside on the deserted street, si si Simon. <laughs> Leaned against the wall of the ironworks, against the ivy-covered colored brick, and stared up at the sky. The lights of the bridge washed out the stars, so there was nothing to see but a sheet of velvety blackness. He wished with a sudden fierceness that he could breathe in the cold air to clear his head, that he could feel it on his face, on his skin. All he was wearing was a thin shirt, and it made no difference. He couldn't shiver, and even the memory of what it felt like to shiver was going away from him, little by little, every day, slipping away like the memories of another life. Simon? He froze where he stood, that voice small and familiar, drifting like a thread on the cold air. Smile. That was the last thing she'd said to him. But it couldn't be. She was dead. Won't you look at me, Simon? Her voice was as small as ever, barely a breath. I'm right here. Dread clawed its way up his spine. He opened his eyes and turned his head slowly. Maureen, it feels weird saying my own name. Maureen stood in the circle of light cast by a street lamp just at the corner of Vernon Boulevard. She wore a long white virginal dress. Her hair was brushed straight down over her shoulders, shining yellow in the lamplight. There was still some grave dirt caught in it. There were little white slippers on her feet. Her face was dead white, circles of rouge painted on her cheekbones, and her mouth colored a dark pink as if it had been drawn on with a felt-tip marker. Simon's knees gave out. He slid down the wall he'd been leaning against until he was sitting on the ground, his knees drawn up. He felt, his head felt like it was going to explode. Maureen gave a girlish little giggle and stepped out of the lamplight. She moved toward him and looked down. Her face wore a look of amused satisfaction. I thought you'd be surprised, she said. You're a vampire, Simon said, but how? I didn't do this to you. I know I didn't. Maureen shook her head. It wasn't you, but it was because of you. They thought I was your girlfriend, you know, and they took me out of my bedroom at night and they kept me in a cage for the whole next day. They told me not to worry because you'd come for me, but you didn't come. You never came. I didn't know. Simon's voice cracked. I would have come if I'd known. Maureen flung her blonde hair black over her shoulder in a gesture that reminded Simon suddenly and painfully of Camille. <coughs> it doesn't matter, she said in a girlish little voice. When the sun went down, they told me I could die or I could choose to live like this, as a vampire. So you chose this? I didn't want to die, she breathed. 
and now I'll be pretty and young forever. I can stay out all night, and I never need to go home, and she takes care of me. Who are you talking about? Who's she? Do you mean Camille? Look, Maureen, she's crazy. You shouldn't listen to her. <laughs> Simon staggered to his feet. I can get you help. I can find you a place to stay, teach you how to be a vampire. Oh, Simon. She smiled, and her little white teeth showed in a precise row. I don't think you know how to be a vampire either. You didn't want to bite me, but you did. I remember. Your eyes went all black like a shark's, and you bit me. I'm so sorry. If you let me help you, you could come with me, she said. That would help me. Come with you where? Maureen looked up and down the empty street. She looked like a ghost in her thin white dress. The wind blew it around her body, but she clearly didn't feel the cold. You have been chosen, she said, because you're a daylighter. Those who did this to me want you, but they know you bear the mark now. They can't get to you unless you choose to come to them, so they sent me as a messenger. She cocked her head to the side like a bird's. I might not be anyone who matters to you, she said, but the next time it will be. They will keep coming for the people you love until there's no one left. So you might as well come with me and find out what they want. Do you know, Simon asked, do you know what they want? She shook her head. She was so pale under the diffuse lamplight that she looked almost transparent, as if Simon could have looked right through her. The way, he supposed, he always had. Does it matter, she said, and reached out her hand. No, he said, I guess it doesn't. And he took her hand. I, I, uh, I didn't know we were supposed to prepare a speech. <laughs> You're still behind me. Hi, Maureen. You don't have to I say anything. I see you. <laughs> Thanks for letting me on stage with the big kids. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to bring you guys up to speed. Uh, you may not be familiar with where we are at this point in the actual plot of these books. So I'm going to read you the last two pages of City of Lost Souls to remind okay. you. <laughs> just so you can, like, you know, just... This is after all the relationship stuff. We, you know, everyone's... There's no more heartbreak. This is just gore, really, and horror <laughs> for these two pages, so... Be prepared for that. I also am not doing the Silent Brother voices. I thought about it a lot, and there's just no way. It's a very serious scene, and it would just be the, is this a, but no, it's not going to happen. What do you mean, kind of talk like this? That's how the Silent Brothers talk yeah, to you? Yeah, they talk like this. They talk like this? Yeah. <laughs> that has a lot of gravitas to the scene, I think. I think that, uh... They're like... Nobody knows, though. It's, it's, this is Zachariah, too, which really... That seems not... My brother Zachariah! Good. Brother Zachariah talks like... I believe brother Zachariah... Uh, okay, we're gonna... We'll do this. It's good. All right. Brother Enoch, said, Mary, said Maris. Jesus. Brother Enoch, said Maris, rising from behind her desk. Thank you for joining me and Brother Zachariah here on such short notice. Is this in regards to Jace? Zachariah inquired. <laughs> And if Maris had not known better, she would have imagined a tinge of anxiety in his mental voice. I have checked in on him several times today. <laughs> his condition has not changed. Enoch shifted within his robes. And I have been looking through the archives and the ancient documentation on the topic of Heaven's Fire. There is some information about the manner in which it may be released, but you must be patient. There is no need to call on us. Should we have news, we will call on you. This is not about Jace, said Maris, and she moved around the desk, her heels clicking on the stone floor of the library. This is about something else entirely. She glanced down. A rug had been carelessly tossed across the floor where no rug usually rested. It did not lie flat, but was draped over an irregular humped shape. It obscured the delicate pattern of tiles that outlined the shape of the cup, the sword, and the angel. She reached down, took hold of a corner of the rug, and yanked it aside. The Silent Brothers did not gasp, of course. They could make no sound. But a cacophony filled Maris's mind, the psychic echo of their shock and horror. Brother Enoch took a step back while Brother Sagariah raised one long, sexy fingered hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't help it. To cover his face, as if he could block his ruined eyes from the sight before him. It was not here this morning, said Maris, but when I returned this afternoon, it awaited me. At the very first glimpse, she had thought that some kind of large bird had found its way into the library and died, perhaps breaking its neck against one of the tall windows. But as she had moved closer, the truth of what she was looking at had dawned on her. She said nothing of the visceral shock of despair that had gone through her like an arrow, 
or the way she had staggered to the window and been sick out of it the moment she'd realized what she was looking at. A pair of white wings, not quite white, really, but an amalgamation of colors that shifted and flickered as she looked at it. Pale silver, streaks of violet, dark blue, each feather outlined in gold. And then there at the root, an ugly gash of sheared off bone and sinew. Angel's wings. Angel's wings that had been sliced from the body of a living angel. Angelic ichor, the color of liquid gold, smeared the floor. Atop the wings was a folded piece of paper addressed to the New York Institute. After splashing water on her face, Maris had taken the letter and read it. It was short, one sentence, and was signed with a name and a handwriting oddly familiar to her. For in it there was the echo of Valentine's cursive, the flourishes of his letters, the strong, steady hand. But it was not Valentine's name. It was his son's, Jonathan Christopher Morgenstern. She held it out now to Brother Zachariah. He took it from her fingers and opened it, reading as she had the single word of ancient Greek scrawled in elaborate script across the top of the page. Erkamai, it said. I am coming. Well, in the 20 minutes that now remains before you get some books, we have some of your questions, which we're going to get right now. And Cassie will answer some of your questions that are coming right now. <laughs> right now. Anytime. Coming right now. <laughs> Very they soon. They are coming now. Well, how are you today, Cassie? <laughs> or jet lag. How are you feeling about this City of Heavenly Fire? It's a lot of books you've written, Cassie. <laughs> You're freaking me out, Maureen. I know. <laughs> well, that's, it's by freaking you out that I got into the book to begin with. That's true. I don't, I, I, I don't know if there's going to be another, you know. Listen, you can always expand my part in City of Simon. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I mean, you know, as he is your prince consort who rules the dark realm. Are you going to give the nice people even a little something to carry them through for the next 20 minutes? It's only 20 minutes. Listen, they might not. <laughs> They're very they, anxious. They've waited a long time. You can hang in there. You can at least tell minutes. them who dies. <laughs> <laughs> All the people that die. I, Scott dies. Scott. <laughs> Scott dies. <laughs> you can tell them who the seven people who die are. Eight. Is it six people who die? Well, seven counting Scott. Yeah, yeah I mean, seven counting Scott. It, it is true. I spent a bunch of time when I had the uh, like actual like final draft of the book, and I was going through it during doing corrections, and I knew that I had been you know mentioned that there were six people whose names we know who die, counting them all <laughs> just to make sure that I had the right number. I was like. This one, and this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And then I couldn't remember one, and I called Holly, and I was like, I think only five people die. I'm going to have to kill somebody. Yeah. <laughs> like an extra person. Who do you think could go? She's like, um. Unfortunately, Homeland Security was monitoring that call. I was actively campaigning that's, for someone to die for a that's while. That's true. were. Yeah. I was, she was. She had a, Maureen had a very specific I had a very specific kill die. list. I'm always, I'm and now Scott is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Scott's going to be really mad when he finds out that we yeah. had this conversation. No? Eh? Yeah. Well. None of nobody, you had questions. Nobody had questions. Questions. How about? Oh, wait. Oh, we have questions. Oh, we have some questions. All okay. right. We got a time for a couple questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to hand out some questions. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, yeah. That um, one? <laughs> seriously? Yeah, you want to? Right. OK, here. I don't know. You guys pick some questions. Edward or Jacob? Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no. Aren't they both like 40 now? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, mm. Yes or no? I, I guess. I, I don't I'm just like. I'm casting my mind back. Um, Edward and Jacob, Edward and Jacob. Um, and I'm also trying to remember the names of the other guys. What are the names of the other guys? Uh, Jasper. Uh, Jasper. Jasper. Jasper was good because he had the crazy eyes. Yeah. You know, Jasper was always like. <laughs> you know? I think. 
I was into that. I think I would pick Jasper because he could use his gonna... freaky mind powers on Who was the guy that was always hot and jumping on trucks with cars? Emmett. 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 That was Emmett. You guys know. But I'm, I'm going to take Jasper. Take Jasper. Jasper's a good answer. All right. <laughs> All right. From Janet, is there a plot line that you took out or considered that would have changed the direction of the series? I don't know if there's a plot line that would have totally changed the direction of the series, but there's a hilarious plot line in City of Ashes where Valentine kept appearing on television that I took out. <laughs> <laughs> like every time they turned on the TV, he was like, <laughs> 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 What am I up to? Nothing good. In a sort of Mariotti <laughs> miss me way? Yeah. <laughs> and then later I was like, That's you. Why did I put that in there? That was unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me see this one. <laughs> do I try to do that one? Aww. <laughs> Can silent brothers talk or communicate on the phone? It's a fair question. <laughs> or do they just Skype? <laughs> that was amazing. They text! They text! <laughs> I think I might die. Um, also, what's happened to the corner of this question? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't it, I think. Um, uh, you know that? I think, I, I think you have stumped me. I've never given a thought to how far their their telepathy extends, but I sort of assumed they had to be kind of in the same place. So I think it would be awesome if they had a conversation on the phone. I mean, all right, you be a silent brother all you want. It's okay. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't they just text? This is going to look great in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would go like that. <laughs> So yeah, I don't really use phones, but I mean, Shadowhunters, as, as a rule, do we use phones all that often. What? What's that? I've got the questions. I, oh, oh, they're just sort of everywhere. I've got one. You've selected some? All right, oh, good. Can I have some? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I have no, I don't. This is like, can I have a question? Yeah, no, but, all right. I have no questions except. I, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> what was, what was the first thing you did when you finished writing City of Heavenly Fire? Did you cry? <laughs> no, I mean, I cried like while I was writing it, but I didn't cry when I was done with writing it. Um, what was the first thing I did when I was finished? I think I slept for like 72 hours because I had been <laughs> like working on it so hard for so long. Um, so yeah, I think I, I think I slept and then um, I made my friends take me out to dinner so I could get drunk and party. <laughs> I, was, I, mean, I was happy, I mean, I wasn't happy to be done, but... But I was, you know, happy to be done. <laughs> There's a, here's a, this is a pretty funny one. What is your favorite crackpot theory for City of Heavenly Fire? Oh, there have been a bunch. Um, I think that my favorite theory is that Church is actually Tessa and that Tessa shape changed into a cat. We see you out there, and you that, crazy like, people. The actual church like died like back in like 1890, and Tessa has been hanging around in cat form. And that, you know, when it comes to like the final battle with evil, the cat will explode into a huge <laughs> like battle monster and like take out Sebastian. Not that that wouldn't be kind of awesome, but um, part of the Transformers. But, but that's movie. it. Would just, be amazing if in the end, <laughs> church is like. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and everyone's like, <laughs> "Yeah, that's, I think that's my favorite." Mm. All right, your turn. Do you find joy in rupturing my feels? <laughs> I just read the cards, people. I'm not. <laughs> You're supposed to ask a question from the card, no. not one that you want to ask. No, I think I yes ruptured. is the answer. Right? That's, I, I mean, you said, do you find Julian rupturing my feels? And I was like, <laughs> Julian? I do sometimes find Julian I'm, rupturing your feels, actually. I find him out rupturing feels, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, yes, because, you know, you want people to, like, be I can't believe you're in, answering this question seriously. And, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yes, and, oh, you know, you want people to be invested and to, like, care. If, like, all of your characters died and everyone was like, eh, then, you know, that's probably not a good sign. It's fun to watch people cry, isn't it? It is. It is, actually. Yeah. You know, like the weeping and the wailing and yeah. stuff on Twitter. Keep it up. <laughs> um, this question, I'm, I'm interested in the phrasing. What do you do to help writer's block? Now, why would you help writer's block? <laughs> You're very mean. I try to encourage writer's block in others. <laughs> because I feel that if everyone else has writer's block, my books will be the only books available. <laughs> 
and thus they will be bestsellers. <laughs> Next time I have them, you're like, damn you, Cassie. <laughs> I know, exactly. Um, usually I call my friends up and I bug them. I mean, you know, they, my, as, you, as you can see, my friends are like very well acquainted with the books and the characters, and um, I'm well acquainted with their books and characters, and so we have kind of a deal where if I'm stuck, they help me. If they're stuck, I help them. It's, I think of it as like House and his little team of doctors, you know? I come in there and I'm like, I have a writer's problem. Like, you know, my, lupus. Book, my book is throwing up blood. <laughs> 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 it's not lupus. What could it be? And they help me out. Mm -hmm. I always have one suggestion. Yeah, it's usually Simon related. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I think Simon should marry Maureen, and I'm like, well, that won't help. But what if Simon just problem. took off all his clothes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that would stop the earth from hurtling into the sun. <laughs> all right. Who draws the runes, and where did you get the designs? Uh, her name is Valerie Frayer. I don't know if she's here tonight. She lives in New York. She's an artist friend of mine, and she created all the runes from scratch. I. Uh, hired her back before City of Bones came out and just said, you know, can you design like maybe 20, you know, runes, give people an idea what they look like, I'll put them on my website, and then she wound up, you know, doing over the course of the years like 60 of them. Um, and, uh, you know, just out of her own imagination. I write novels as well, but struggle with picking names. How do you choose characters' names? Well, I, I steal them. I mean, you know, and I advise <laughs> you to do the same uh, in the sense that, like, you know, whenever you see, uh, right, look at movie credits, yes. look at anything where there's, you know, the phone book, anything where there's long lists of names, and just look for interesting names, you know, and like grab first names, you know, grab last names, put them together in interesting com combinations. Um, and I caught Maris's name from like a hotel registry. So I, you never know when you're gonna come across an interesting name, but um, write it down or you will forget it. This is a kind of touching one. Was it hard for you to let go of these characters in the series now that you're, yes. are you sad now? I am sad. Are you really sad? <laughs> well, now I am. Mm. No, now I'm freaked out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, it was very hard. City of Simon. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't think that could happen after City of Heavenly Fire. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> They're on the brink of death already. <laughs> Don't screw with them. <laughs> They're like animals. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> oh dear, I think you ruptured her feelings. I ruptured her you ruptured, they're ruptured. Wait, did somebody say this is not Hannibal? <laughs> yes, yes. yes, I love Hannibal. You're not caught up. I'm not caught up, that's true. I don't know what, I've been living in England. I, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not caught up. But no one eats Simon, all right? He doesn't get eaten. He remains uneaten. No one eats oh, Simon. No, that's you can a little. <laughs> that's no fine. about that. No, I'm glad I did this. <laughs> all right, is there another question? Uh, I have taken almost only the silliest possible Okay, question, that, that seems so you know. good. Do you think that when everyone else is dead in like a hundred years, Simon and Tessa could have a relationship? <laughs> <laughs> you are discounting Magnus, first of all, from that equation. <laughs> Come back for you. need to stop this. <laughs> Nine minutes, everybody. It was, was well-timed. Uh, I, uh... I, don't, I, I think the answer is no. I mean, I don't know. I, I think the answer is no. They would have to no. meet. I know. I always overthink things. I don't, I don't, I don't think it would work out between them. Also, I, I mean, honestly, I, I think of Tessa as, like, loving Will and Jem and, like, nobody else ever. It's very sad. <laughs> you know. And I'm not saying anything else about Simon. You're freaking me out. All right. Yeah, Holly? Nice. Me? Yeah. What is the hardest scene you've ever had to write from Michael the Sword? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> the Sword wants to know. Uh, what's the hardest scene I've ever had to write? Michael oh, the Sword? Oh, my God. Um, Michael the Sword wants to know. Sword? Is he said Michael? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that it was... Well, okay, I'm leaving out City of Heavenly Fire because you guys haven't read it. So, of all other books, I think it was probably the epilogue of Clark Rock Princess. I cried a lot. Oh, yeah. 
pretty sad. And I, I think I rewrote it like 14 or 15 times because I was having such a hard time with it. Like it was such an emotional like thing to have to write and I felt like I had to get the balance of emotions really right and it was also really upsetting me. So I think Holly can um, definitely testify that I wrote it, rewrote it about 15 or 16 times and made her read every single version. <laughs> Yeah, but that wasn't the scene. I the it was the the there was one scene in the book right Clockwork before Man. it that Clockwork you Man. um that you kept giving to me and being like, did you cry? Did you cry yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was the scene where Will tells Tasha that like, yes, he loves her. It was and, really and upsetting, and you were like, I don't think you're upset enough uh, yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, is it painful? <laughs> no, you don't look really that upset. I'm gonna make it more painful. <laughs> <laughs> It actually <laughs> told me a lot about making things painful. <laughs> that was actually, finally, I think I made her cry, and I was like, all right. It scares me that you were making this motion while you were talking about <laughs> pain for Holly. Is it painful now? Is it painful now? That's the, well, the co-writing process actually, in a nutshell. Maybe, that's... maybe she was crying because I was punching <laughs> her. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, so exciting that you two are writing a book together now, that this is your... Oh, yeah. This is your... We, have, we share like a document and like we Skype and write in it since I'm in England right now, but um, also sometimes I sneak into it when, when Holly's not, <laughs> when Holly's asleep and I paint it up. <laughs> <laughs> like pain. <laughs> <laughs> Just add the adverb sadly to all of the actions. <laughs> I remember being like, how much blood can you get into a middle grade book? <laughs> and Holly was like, I don't know. And then I like wrote a couple sentences. She's like, that's about as much as you can get in. <laughs> right there. I had a little more. I was like, David will take it out. <laughs> it's too much blood. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Anybody? Yeah, what's your favorite part of the writing process? Man, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> um, oh, man. Um, I mean, all, all parts of the writing process have their, have their like, sort of joys and drawbacks, but um, for me, I actually really love first drafting. A lot of people hate it, but I like the, you know, energy of, like, getting the words out there and down on the paper and getting to know the characters. It's because you're fast. Yeah. You are like the wind. But I'm not a fast reviser. I mean, Cass Cassie all... type is a... <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. she can talk and type. No, but it's like this. No, it's too many it's fingers. Like Two <laughs> fingers. She types like, she types like a type cub like reporter from the 20s. Me too. No, or like, like Dateline, Washington, D.C. Like like <laughs> it is an extraordinary thing to watch you type because you can have a full conversation with Cassie and she'll be like, and the solution to Fermat's <laughs> theorem. <laughs> She's like, I just wrote a chapter. And I'll be like, yeah. well, I can have like low level conversation. I can be like, you know, Iron Man is clearly the best Avenger, but nothing like too complicated. <laughs> Okay, I actually know what this refers to, but I'm going to ask it to you exactly as written, and I would like you to answer it in that vein. Do Isabel's eyes turn into something big? <laughs> Boy, I'm going to spit that. Um, I know I'm well familiar with the theory that, that, that Isabel's eye color is important to the overall plot, but... Um, I can't say yes or no. You're gonna find out in like four minutes. <laughs> I'm just getting word actually that the the books have caught fire. <laughs> right. And there are no fire. books. Sorry, no book. Just right, kidding. No last, last question. Last question. Okay, last question. question. Bring on home, Maureen. Oh, I don't really have. Wait, everybody, to... just stay where you are. Yeah, don't where move. You are. Why, yes. why? You need order. Don't order go. Order among the chaos? Yes. They're getting in line. Don't go or she will kill Jace. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone moves. Just write it into each book manually. Yeah, I don't care either. You know what? I have two words when I hear the word Jace. No, I have two words and that is Jace who? That is it. All right, do we have one final question? It's you. Anybody got anything? All right. Um... This is not a good final question. <laughs> Do you have a good final question? Why is there no cat romance in these books? That's the question. Why I swear no, to God that is actually a card. Why is there no cat romance? Why isn't there a cat romance? <laughs> the fans demand an there answer. Is a cat romance. Well, I mean, there's, yeah, there there's, there's a made-up cat romance because Church and Chairman Mirror are both neutered. <laughs> I, I think Church immortal but neutered. Oh, jeez. They can have like a spiritual love, I guess. 
Um, I think because I have three cats, and when I look at them, romance is not what springs to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like an appropriate bombshell. Yes, I think so. And this part of the program, and to start to transition to the signing part of the program, and everybody to get their books. I believe everybody is supposed to remain. Yeah. Right. I have no idea. In orderly fashion, I, believe. I don't know what the I do not know what the process is. Perhaps someone who knows should come yeah, out here and tell people what to do. We need somebody <laughs> official to instruct. We have no idea what we're doing up here. Um, hi guys. Um, I think we're are we we are finished. We're done. We are done. So yay. We'll, Thank we'll you clap. Very much.